June 23rd. Start off steaming upriver early in the morning time. Land ahead, showing mountainous. Rather suddenly, the banks grow higher. Here and there in the forest are patches which look like regular handmade plantations, which are not, which they are not, but only patches of ignobi, gobi trees, showing that at this place was once a native town. Whenever land is cleared along here, this tree springs up all over the ground. It grows very rapidly and has great leaves, sometimes like a sycamore leaf, only much larger. These leaves growing in a cluster at the top of the straight stem give an umbrella-like appearance to the affair, so the natives call them, call them an umbrella by the same name. But whether they think the umbrella is like the tree or the tree like the umbrella, I can't make out. I'm always getting myself mixed up getting myself mixed over this kind of thing in my attempts to contemplate phenomena from a scientific standpoint, as Cambridge ordered me to do. I'll give the habit up. You can't do that sort of thing out here. It's the climate, and I will content myself with stating the fact that when a native comes into a store and wants an umbrella, he asks for an agobi, an, an gobi, gobi. The uniformity of the height of the individual trees in the one one of these patches is striking, and it arises from their all star starting fair. I cannot make out other things about them to my satisfaction, for you very rarely see one of them in the wild bush, and then it does not bear a fruit that the natives collect and use, and then chuck away the, the stones round their domicile. Anyhow, there are there they are, all one height and all one color, and apparently allowing no other vegetation to make any headway among them. But I found when I carefully investigated Ngombi Gombi patches that there were a few of the great slower growing forest trees coming up amongst them. And in time, when these attain a sufficient height, their shade kills off the Ngombi Gombi, and the patch goes back into the great forest from which it came. The frequency of these patches arises from the nomadic habits of the chief tribe in the region, the Fans. They rarely occupy one site for a village for any considerable time on account, firstly, of their wasteful method of collecting rubber by cutting down the vine, which soon stamps it out of his district, and secondly, secondly, from their quarrelsome ways. So when a village of Fans has cleared all the rubber out of its district, or has made the said district too hot to hold it by rows with other villages, or has got itself very properly shelled out and burnt for some attack on traders or the French flag in any form, its inhabitants clear off into another district and build another village, for bark and palm thatch are cheap, and the house, is, house removing just nothing when you are an unsophisticated cannibal fan. You don't require an, a Panotechnicon van to stow away your one or two mushroom-shaped stools, knives, and cooking pots, and a calabash or so. If you are rich, maybe you will have a box with clothes in it as well. But as a general rule, all your clothes are on your back. So your wives just pick up the stools and the knives and the cooking pots and the box, and the children toddle off with their with the calabashes. You have, of course, the gun to carry, for, sleeping or waking, a fan never parts with his gun. And so you, and so there you are, finish, as Monsieur Picolt would say. And before your new bark house is up, there grows the Ngombi Gombi, where your house once stood. Now and again, for lack of immediate neighboring villages to quarrel with, one end of the village will quarrel with the other end. The weaker end then goes off and builds itself another village, keeping an eye lifting for any member of the stronger end who may come conveniently into its neighborhood to be killed and eaten. Meanwhile, the Ngombi Gobi grows over the houses of the empty end, pretending it's a phantom belonging to the remaining half. I once heard a news newcomer hold forth eloquently as to how those fans were maligned. They say, said he, with a fine wave of his arm towards such a patch, that these people do not till the soil, that they do not they are not industrious, that they the few plantations they do make are ill kept, that they are only a set of wandering hunters and cannibals. Look there at those magnificent plantations. I did look, but I did not alter my opinion of the fans, for I know my old friend Ngombi Gombi when I see him. This morning the French official seems sad and melancholy. I fancy he has got a Monday head, Kipling, 
but he revives as the day goes on. As we go on, the banks become hills, and the broad river, which has been showing sheets of sandbanks in all directions, now narrows and shows only neat little beaches of white sand in the shallow places along the bank. The current is terrific. The eclair breathes hard, and all she breathes hard and has all she can do to fight her way up against it. Masses of black weathered rock and great boulders show along the exposed parts of both banks, left dry by the falling waters. Each bank is steep, and quantities of great trees, naked and bare, are hanging down from them, held by the roots and bush rope entanglement from being swept away with the rushing current, and they make a great white fringe to the banks. The hills become higher and higher, and more and more abrupt, and the river runs between them in a gloomy ravine, winding to and fro. We catch sight of a patch of white sand ahead, which I mistake for a white painted house. But immediately after doubling round a bend, we see the houses of the Taluga mission station. The eclair forthwith has an hysterical fit on her whistle, so as to frighten Monsieur Foguet and to get him to dash off in his canoe to, to her at once. Apparently he knows her, and does not hurry, but comes on board quietly. I find that there will be no place for me to stay at Nijol, so I decide to go on in the Eclateur and use her as a hotel while there, and then return and stay with Mademoiselle Forget, if she will have me. I consult Monsieur Foguet on this point. He says, oh yes, but seems to have lost something of great value recently, and not to be quite clear where. Only manners, I suppose. When Monsieur Foguet has got his mails, he goes, and the clear goes on. Indeed, she has never really stopped, for the water is too deep to anchor in here, and the terrific current would, pr would promptly whisk the steamer down out of the Telugu gorge, where she were she to leave off fighting it. We run up on past Telugu Island, where the river broadens out again a little, but not much, and reach Njol by nightfall, and tie up to a tree by Dumas's factory beach. Usual uproar, but, as Mr. Cockshut says, no mosquitoes. The mosquito belt ends abruptly at Osomokita. Next morning, I go ashore and start on a walk. Lovely road, bright yellow clay, as hard as paving stone. On each side, it is most neatly hedged with pine, ap pine apples. Behind these, carefully tended, acres of coffee bushes planted in long rows. Certainly, coffee is one of the most lovely of the crops. Its shaded, its grandly shaped, shaded, shaped, its grandly shaped leaves are like those of our medlar tree only darker and richer green, the berries set close to the stem, those that are ripe a rich crimson. These trees, I think, are about three years old and just coming into bearing, for they are covered with full-sized berries, and there has been a flush of bloom on them this morning, and the delicious fragrance of their stephanosis-shaped and scented flowers lingers in the air. The country spreads before me, a lovely valley encompassed by purple-blue mountains. Mount Telugo, looks splendid in a soft, infinitely deep blue, although it is quite close, just the other side of the river. The road goes on into the valley, as pleasantly as ever, and more so. How pleasant it would be now if our government along the coast had the enterprise and public spirit of the French, and made such roads just on the remote chance of straying travellers dropping in on a steamer once in ten years or so, and wanting a walk. Observe extremely neat, Observe extremely neat Iguala, Igalua, built huts, people sitting on the bright clean ground outside them, making mats and baskets. Mablulani, I say. Ay, Mablu, they say, and knock off work to stare. Observe large, wired-in enclosures on the left-hand side of road. Investigate. Find they are tenanted by animals, goats, sheep, chickens, etc., Clearly, this is a jardin de climatisation. No wonder the colony does not pay if it goes, on, goes in for this sort of thing, 206 miles inland, with simply no public to pay gate money. While contemplating these things, hear awful hiss, serpents, no, geese, awful fight, grand things, good old-fashioned long skirts are for Africa, get through geese and advance in good order, but somewhat rapidly down road, turn sharply round corner of native houses. 
Turkey cock. Terrific turn up. Flight on my path forward down road, which is still going strong, now in a north northerly direction. Apparently indefinitely. Hope to goodness there will be a turning that I can go down and get back by without returning through this ferocious farmyard. Intent on picking up such an outlet, I go thirty yards or so down the road. Hear shouts coming from a clump of bananas on my left. No, they are directed at me, but it does not do to attend to shouts always. Expect it is only some native with an awful knowledge of English, anxious to get up my family history. Therefore, accelerate pace. More shouts, and louder, of Madame Gacon! Madame Gacon! And out of the banana clump comes a big, plump, pleasant-looking gentleman, clad in a singlet and divided skirt. White people must be attended to. So advance carefully towards him through a plantation of young coffee, apologizing humbly for intruding on his domain. He smiles and bows beautifully. But, horror, he knows no English. I know French. Situation très inexplicable et très interessant, as I subsequently heard him remark. And the worst of it is, he is evidently bursting to know who I am and what am I doing in the middle of his coffee plantation. For his it clearly is, as appears from his obsequious bodyguards of blacks, highly interested in me also. We gaze at each other and smile some more, but stiffly, and he stands bareheaded in the sun in an awful way. It's murder I'm committing. Hard all. He, as is fitting for his superior sex, displays intelligence first and says, Interpreter, waving his hand to the south. I say, yes, in my best fan, an enthusiastic, intelligent grunt, which anyone must understand. He leads the way back towards the ge those geese, perhaps by the by. That is why he wears those divided skirts. And we enter a beautifully, neatly built bamboo house and sit down opposite to each other at a table and wait for the interpreter who is being fetched. The house is low on the ground and of native construction, but most beautifully kept and arranged with an air of artistic feeling quite as unexpected as the rest of my surroundings. I notice upon the walls sets of pictures of terrific incidents in Algerian campaigns and a copy of that superb head of Monsieur de Braza in Arab headgear. Soon the black minions who have been sent to find one of the plantation hands who is supposed to know French and English return with the interpreter. That young man is a fraud. He does not know English, not even coast English, and all he has got under his precious wool is an abysmal ignorance darkened by terror. And so, after one or two futile attempts and, the, and some frantic scratchings at both these regions, which an African seems to regard as the seats of an intellectual inspiration, he bolts out the door. Situation terrible. My host and I smile wild, widely at each other, and both wonder in our respective languages what, in other words, of Mr. Squeers, as mentioned in the classics, shall we do in this ear most awful go? We are both going mad with the strain of the situation, when in walks the engineer's brother from the Eclatair. He seems intensely surprised to find me sitting in his friend's, the planter's parlor, after my grim and retiring conduct on the eclair on my voyage up. But the planter tells him all, sousing him in torrents of words, full of violence of an outbreak of pent-up emotion. I do not understand what he is saying, but I catch, tray inexplicable, and things like that. The calm brother of the engineer sits down at the table, and I'm sure tells the planter something like this. Calm yourself, my friend. We picked up this curiosity at Lembraire. It seems quite harmless. And then the planter calmed and mopped a perspiring bow, brow, and so did I. And we smiled more freely, feeling the mental atmosphere had become less tense and cooler. We both simply beamed on our deliverer, and the planter gave him lots of things to drink. I had nothing about me except the head of a tobacco in my pocket, which I did not feel was a suitable offering. Now the engineer's brother, although he would not own to it, knew English, so I told him how the beauty of the road had lured me on, and how I was interested in coffee planting, and how much I admired the magnificence of this plantation, and all the enterprise, and the energy it represented. Oui, oui, certainement, he said, and translated. My friend the planter seemed charmed. It was the first sign of anything approaching reason he had seen in me. He wanted me to have an eau secure more kindly than ever, and when I arose, intending to bow myself off and go, geese or no geese, back to the eclair, he would not let me go. I must see the plantation, 
toute la plantation. So presently, all three of us go out and thoroughly do the plantation, the most well-ordered, well-cultivated plantation I have ever seen, and a very noble monument to the knowledge and industry of the planter. For two hot, for two hot hours, these two perfect gentlemen showed me over it. I also behaved well, for petticoats, great as they are, do not prevent insects and catawumpuses of sorts walking up one's ankles and feeding on one as one stands on the long grass which has been most wisely cut and laid round the young trees for mulching. This plantation is of great extent on the hillsides and in the valley bottom. Portions of it are just coming into bearing. The whole is kept as perfectly as a garden. Amazing as the work is amazing as the work of one white man with only a staff of unskilled native laborers at present only 80 of them the coffee planted is of three kinds the elephant berry the arabian and the sand foam during our inspection we only had one serious misunderstanding which arose from my seeing for the first time in my life tree ferns growing in ogwe there were three of them evidently carefully taken care of among some coffee plants it was highly excited, and I tried to find out about them. It seemed, even in this center of enterprise, unlikely that they had been bought just for dandy from the Australian Australasian region, and I'd never yet come across them in my wandering save on Fernando Po. Unfortunately, my friends thought I wanted to, them to keep, and shouted for men to bring things and dig them up. So I had a brisk little engagement with the men, driving them from their prey with a point of my umbrella, ejaculating cor cor like an agitated crow. When at last they understood that my interest in the ferns was scientific, not piratical, they called the men off and explained that the ferns had been found among the bush when it had been cleared for the plantation. Ultimately, with many bows and most sincere thanks for me, we parted providentially beyond the geese and I return down the road to Njol, where I found, find Mr. Cockshut waiting outside his factory. He insists on taking me to the post to see the administrator, and from there he says I can go on to the Eclair from the post beach, as she will be up there from Dumas's. Off we go up the road, which skirts the river bank, a dwarf clay cliff overgrown with vegetation, save where it is cleared for the beaches. The road is short, but exceedingly pretty. On the other side from the river is a steep bank on which is growing a plantation of cacao. Lying out in the center of the river, you see Njol Island, a low, sandy one, timbered not only with bush, but with orange and other fruit trees. For formerly the posts and factories used to be situated on the island. Now only their trees remain for various reasons, one being that in the wet season it is a good deal underwater. Everything is now situated on the mainland north bank in a straggling but picturesque line. First come Warman's factory, then Hatton and Cookson's, and John Holt's, close together with a beach in common in a sweetly amicable style for these for factories, who, as a f rule, firmly stockade themselves off from their next-door neighbors. Then Dumas's beach, a little native village, the cacao patch, and the post at the up-river end of things, European, an eth end of things European, I'm told, for a matter of 500 miles. Immediately beyond the post is a little river falling into the Ogwe, and on its further bank a small village belonging to a chief, who, hearing of the glories of the government, came down like the Queen of Sheba, in intention, I mean, not personal appearances, to see it, and so charmed is he being that here he stays to gaze on it.